All right, welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm Adam Morgan, Senior Creative Director at Adobe. Oh, that's great. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Not expecting that. We're just having a chat. Um, my journey to this stage began about seven years ago when my client, Russell Fisher, sat back in his chair, thought about it for a minute, and, and asked me a question. So you see, at the time, before I joined Adobe four years ago, I had worked for about 20 years in a variety of international ad agencies. And Russell was my client. He was a, a regional bank, and I had just presented to him a, a billboard campaign. We had like, you know, three different billboards, all creative, trying to get him to sell you know, some financial product. But the question that Russell asked was a really, really interesting question. Because he said this, he said, Adam, I trust you. I tr you know, we've worked together for a while. I trust you know what kind of creative ideas are going to work, you know, how we're going to reach m my audience, how we're going to stick or stand out through the clutter. But my boss is a sales guy, and he doesn't believe in marketing. He thinks it's all just fluffy stuff, right? It's just window dressing. So this was his question. He said, what can you give me? What can you give me that I can take to my boss that will prove why these creative ideas are going to be better than a boring and straightforward message? Because that's what my boss wants. He just wants to just tell him the information, get it out there on the billboard, and call it a day, right? And this question that he asked, like, it was really profound, and it made me go back and think about it. I mean, obviously, I did research on it for seven years, but this was really the question he was asking. Do creative ideas work better? Is there a benefit to a creative idea versus a straightforward idea? And this is a question that has plagued our industry for the, the last 20 years, since the beginning of, of the creative industry, right? So when I started in the mid-90s, there were agencies that were all about creativity and agencies that were all about results. You had companies that were all about direct marketing and strategy, and the others that were all about branding and awareness, right? Has anyone experienced that, that battle where it's always, you know, and it's getting even worse today where it's like, we've got data-driven marketing versus creative ideas. This is the battle that we've been in. This is the question we want, have been wanting to answer for years. So anyhow, back to Russell's question. What ended up happening is I went back, and I didn't really have a good answer for him that day. Um, you know, and inevitably... You know, we, the, we sold a couple billboards. The, Russell's boss ended up wanting a straightforward headline and it ended up being a terrible experience. But, you know, at least for me, I went back and I had that question of like, how do I prove this? And I started looking for books. I started looking for information. Like, let me ask this question. Has anyone here ever had a, an internal stakeholder or a client that didn't really get on board with creativity and you felt like you had to like convince them that it was important and, and valuable? Like, you've all had that. Or, or maybe you're the person who doesn't believe in creativity, and you're here to, to see what this guy has got to show, because you're like, well, yeah, right, you know, I'd love you to prove it to me. So anyhow, this is the situation that we've had. And in the past, the way people have tried to prove the value of creativity is through case studies, right? Oh, Nike did this great campaign, Apple did this awesome campaign, and it was creative, or, or this company did this campaign, and it won awards, therefore it's, it's got good ROI, right? Like, there's been... And it's, the problem with that is it's too subjective because the same companies, those same case studies are being used on the other side saying, no, it wasn't because of the creativity, it was because of this awesome strategy and some really good you know, channel reach, whatever it may be, like that's why the campaign was awesome. So when I tried to answer this question, my quest was to figure a way to answer it that was not subjective. Because I don't know how many of you have dealt with the whole subjectivity of, of headlines and creativity. It's really hard, right? Like, Everyone has a different opinion about it. So how do I prove that creative ideas work better, but that's not subjective? And so that was my quest, was to go back, and it took me seven years, and, and this presentation that I'm going to give you today is a lot of what I've learned in that narrative arc from all my research, because the way I wanted to do it is through science. I wanted to go back to a CFO and say, here you go. This is the reason why creative ideas work, and it's not subjective, so you, you, know, you have to pay attention to it because it's based on neuroscience and science, period. That's my goal. Felt like a valuable thing to me, so hopefully it is to you. That's why I'm sharing today. All right, and one thing I do want to point out is when I'm talking about creative ideas, like there's a lot of different ways to talk about this. Capital D design, capital C creativity. But at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is when I'm saying a creative idea, I'm talking about an emotional idea, right? As creative people, we've, been tra we've trained ourselves over the years to get really, really good whatever you may call it, empathy or just understanding the customer, but we've been really, really good at finding that emotional connection because that's what the, the holy grail is, right? 
to create an ad or to create an experience that sucks someone in and, and it has that emotional response. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. All right, so now we're going to get into some science. Here's kind of how this presentation is going to lay out. I'm going to share with you a bunch of studies and create a narrative arc of proving the value of creativity. And then after that, I'm going to walk through a, several uh, use cases, like daily ways you can put this into action, and I can show how I've used this knowledge to help me create better experiences. And then after that, hopefully we can get to some Q&A. All right, so let's start with, and sit in your, you know, get ready. This, we're going to go through a lot of neuroscience, a lot of detailed studies, so get ready for it. Anyone here a neuroscientist? Okay, we got one. Just for the record, this is like, I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm a writer, a creative, right? I'm just bringing it all together in a narrative so that you can understand it. So anyone who's a neuroscientist, you certainly will know more than I do. All right, let's start with some of the basics that we're used to. We've heard about the right and the left hemispheres of the, of the brain, right? The left is all about denotation, and it's mainly like the connection between things, so a linear, a linear chain of events. That's what the left is all about. It's really good at that. Whereas the right hemisphere is all about connotation, which is connecting things. So if you've ever understood the punchline of a joke, that's connotation in action. And that's usually, you know, with all the stories you hear about. It's all right, le right or left brain type of thinking. But the reality is it's more tricky. Like in neuroscience, it's not so much about the left and the right, but it's more of the front and the back. So what I've highlighted in this little image here is the, is the frontal cortex or the frontal lobe. And in reality, that's the area that makes us unique as humans. That's where we have this, you know, that's the enlarged forehead right behind, the, you know, your eyes is what makes us have the ability to put off things for later, to manage our time, to make, you know, conscious, deep decisions. And that, you know, the, the darling of the industry is the prefrontal cortex, but that's really like the area of rationality. That's really the, the deep thinking that's going on in the front of the brain. And the back of the brain is more of like the deep storage. So if you think of it in terms of like your RAM and your hard drive, that's, that's a good analogy there. But the truth is, it's not, even, it's not even just the front and the back or the right and the left. Like, the brain is amazing. There's like, what, 86 billion neurons, and they're all deeply interconnected. And there are amazing, crazy stories where people have had, like the corpus callosum that, that connects the two hemispheres, either cut or they were born without it. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of um, savants who don't have that connection. There was this one famous guy, you know the movie Rain Man that it was based on? He could look at a book and one eye would read one page, the other eye would read the other page, and he'd memorize like, he'd memorize like 12,000 books, and it was as if two different halves of his brain were working independently, right? And then there's other stories where like, a little girl has a, you know, some severe brain damage on one side, so they remove it, and the other side of the brain starts to learn the things that the missing half used to do. So she was able to learn and grow and walk and talk, even though she shouldn't be able to because she's missing that half of the brain. So the point is that the brain is a mess, and I'm not going to get into the deep, you know, all the different things like the amygdala to the cerebellum to all that stuff. I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm going to talk in general terms. There are a lot of neurons and there's a lot of things connected and you need all of it. So the myth of the 10% is not there. Like you need your whole noodle. That's what, that's what we need. Okay, so instead of talking about the specific parts, I'm just going to talk about these general terms of logic versus emotion for a while. And this goes back to that same thing in the agencies and in the companies of the, of the two different sides, right? So let me start out with this question first. And don't, don't raise your hands yet. But I want you to really answer this for yourself. Do you put more value on logic or emotion? And let me give you some context. So think back into all of our culture and history. So Descartes started out years and years ago, and he talked about the little charioteer that was the logic, and it was whipping and driving back our animal instincts to keep them in check because those animal instincts and that emotion is just too raw, and you need to, to be a good human being, you need to control that. And if you look at all of our culture since then, in a lot of Western culture, it really is about that. If you're going to make a good decision, just chill out, slow down, and really think about it, and then you'll make the right decision. Think how that's influenced so many things of our culture. Think of schools. I mean, there are plenty of books. And by the way, let me just say this right now. If you want a copy of this deck, I'll show you at the end a way that you can get it, and then also a way that you can continue the conversation with me. So I'd love to share some other thoughts if you want to. But there are a lot of books on our, on our education system, for example, that talk about how everything we test and learn is all just logic, logic, logic based. Sure, we have art class and we laugh and let a few kids go to art class, but it's like predominantly everything we're focused on is logic. Logic is king. Rational thought is what makes us smarter and more advanced, right? 
And this even bleeds into business. I've had some, many business associates, there was this one strategist, anytime we were doing anything, she would say, whoa, whoa just, let's just stop and really think about it, and, we'll, and that's where we'll find a good strategy. Let's, let's, not, let's not get it all emotional about it, right? And then you think about all the MBAs. I mean, there's probably many of you who are MBAs in this room, but going through those courses, it's, it really teaches you to focus on numbers and put the priority of good decisions based on finance and numbers. And, it's not, and you're not trained to understand emotions or how they fit into the equation. So with that background, do we put, do we put more value on logic or emotion? All right, so to help, let's talk a little bit about that relationship between the two things. So I'm going to start out with some stories. So any good neuroscience story starts out with this gentleman. This is uh, Phineas Gage, 1848 in Cavendish, Vermont. He was the foreman of a railroad crew, and they were going through and putting down track and blasting uh, rocks out of the way so they could clear the path. And the way they'd do that is they'd drill this deep hole, and then they'd put a bunch of black powder in there, and then they'd take a, take a tamping iron. If you look at his hands, he's got a six-foot rod. And they'd smack and tamp down the black powder, put a fuse in it, run away, and light it and blow it up. Unfortunately for Phineas, as he was tamping it down one day, the rod hit the side of the rock, caused a spark, and blew up in his face. And that rod went up underneath his chin, through, sorry for that, through the eyeball and out the top of his head. And in the process, took out a chunk of his brain with it. Now, here's the amazing part. I know that's a little graphic. I see some of these faces. Sorry about that. The amazing part is he didn't die. Like, a hole blown in his head, and he didn't die. And even when the doctor got there, and they bandaged him up, bandaged him up as best they could, um, he was conscious and alert and rational. Now, the strange thing that happened, and what they didn't understand later on, is Phineas totally changed. He used to be an awesome boss, upstanding individual, and then he became this, like, shady character that just was very impulsive and in a skin flint and just like not a good guy to be around until the day he died. And we really didn't know a lot of what's going on. There's a lot of controversy around Phineas until in the late 90s. And then this gentleman came along, Antonio Damasio. And he was a neuroscientist that studied and worked with a lot of people that had the same chunk of their brain damaged or missing as Phineas Gage. And in his book, he tried to understand what was going on. And what he found is the area that was removed is the area that helps regulate emotion. So of all of his patients, they may have had a, you know, some sort of a trauma or some cancer or something, and they removed that section, and then he did studies with them to try and figure out what was going on. And it was interesting, one famous uh, patient of his, he would ask him simple questions like, when should we set up the next appointment? And as if the patient every single time would start from square one, he would say, Whoa, well, let's see. And he would do this like pro-con list of like, well, I like going into the city on Thursdays, not Wednesdays, but of course my wife and I always have to, you know, he, he would just deliberate and deliberate and deliberate, and it took him forever. Like any simple decision, he couldn't figure it out. And this was the interesting detail that we learned from Antonio. We learned that a brain that cannot feel cannot make a decision. So remember that. If you can't feel, if there's no emotion, you cannot make a decision. And we'll get into that a little bit later, and you'll understand why. Let me tell you another story or another study. This was done by Cosmody and Tubi. It was called Evolutionary Psychology, a Primer. And what they wanted to do was figure out and say, okay, you know, with these, these animal instincts that we have, is this what like, holds us down and really logic is what helps us be you know, better human beings and we really have to control this, all these animal instincts. And so they, they really dug in deep to try and figure that out. And here's what they learned. They actually learned that emotions weren't something that you had to control that were like animal-like. It was actually the fact that emotion, or sorry, humans have so many more emotions than animals, that's what makes us more human. Like we have the ability to love. We have the ability to fear disease, right? There are so many emotions that we have far and above what animals have, and it's the, all those emotions that actually make us better you know, human beings. All right, next, we, so we've talked a little bit about the, the relationship between logic and, and emotion and how it works. So you, you, you have to have emotion, and, and emotions actually are what makes us humans. But how do scientists deal with this? And the way they do is they talk about these two different systems. Rather than you know, different chunks, the right, the left half of the brain, they really like to talk in two different systems. And if any of you have read books from like Daniel Kahneman or um, you know, like Thinking Fast and Slow, and there are many others, they won a Nobel Prize on this topic. But it's really talking about, instead of saying the parts, let's talk about the systems or the way our brains work. And there really are two different types of systems. 
And if you've ever heard of anything about the crock brain, that's, that's old news, that's not new. So just think of the two systems. So there's a fast system and a slow system. So in describing these two systems, the first one, our conscious system, that's what we're aware of, right? That's actually very slow, cognitive, and rational. And then our fast system is our subconscious. So it's very automatic and, and, uh, and more emotional. And many people may say, yeah, right. Like, uh, whatever I'm aware of, I, I'm a pretty sharp person. I can, I'm a, you know, a, co a comedic artist. I can come up with jokes really, really fast. Like, my brain goes really, really fast. That's fast. It's not the slow system. And I'm going to explain a little more of why that is true, that it really is the slow system. So first, let's just think about this. You're only consciously aware of a small part of what's going on in your brain. In fact, everything that's below the hood, everything in the subconscious is what's exciting to neuroscientists, right? They're trying to figure out what's going on because we don't have awareness around it. But the little teeny part that we're aware of is, is not what it, like, keeps the lights on. If you had to consciously be aware of every, like if I was walking across the stage and every ligament, every muscle, and I had to like, logically try and make it all work, or even breathing, like I had to make sure it inflated and closed and all the nerves and everything were working in, in perfect unison, that would make me go crazy if you were consciously aware of it. But yet our subconscious handles all of that and so much more all the time. Like it, it really is the powerhouse beneath the water that is making everything happen. And it's only the lightweight stuff like rocket science or, you know, being a doctor, you know, that's the stuff that's okay for our, our conscious brain to handle because it doesn't kill us. Anything that's going to kill us is going to be handled by our subconscious because we can't trust the, our rational thought to handle that. Let me tell you some more studies. So there was a famous study by, done by George A. Miller called uh, The Magical Number 7, Plus or Minus 1, Some Thoughts on Our, on our um, Capacity for Processing Information. And he did all these studies to figure out how much our logic could actually handle. And he put it at four to seven variables. Now, that was a while ago, and, and there have been newer studies done, like the University of Missouri did one, and they actually put it closer to about, you know, three to four chunks of data. So if you think about why phone numbers are in, in chunks of three or four, it's because our short-term memory or our rational thought can only handle a few variables at a time, right? It's only capable of handling a few. You may think, oh, you know, I'm good at multitasking. That's not true. You're good at multi-switching, but you can still only hold a few variables, you know? On average, maybe someone out there can hold eight, and uh, we praise you for that. But it's still only a few variables. What about the subconscious? The subconscious, so the Salk Institute did a recent study about a year and a half ago where they figured out exactly how much uh, information is being held back there or how much it can handle, and it's equivalent to the entire Internet. So every single one of us can hold as much information as the whole entire Internet right now. Think about that. Think of all the YouTube videos Millions of Facebook posts, the entire audio track of Zombo.com, if anyone has ever made it to the end of that thing, right? That, all that information, every single one of us can hold in our brains and our subconscious. That's massive. Like, it can hold a lot of variables versus three or four. But you may not believe me, so we're going to do a little test. You're going to figure it out for yourself right now, your fast and your slow system, okay? So first, we're going to start out with your slow system. I'm going to give you a couple little examples. Let's start with this one. Do this little math formula, please. Right about now, 578, someone's going to shout it out, right? That was lightning fast. All right, and that's an easy one. Now let me give you what they do in, this, in the labs, a real test of your logical system. Has anyone ever taken a real IQ test? And I'm not talking like an online cheesy survey, like a real IQ test. Okay, some have taken them. Like, they're intense. Like, they have you hold numbers in your head and go backwards and do all these things so they can see and test the capacity of how much you can hold, right? It's really, really intense. So we're going to do a light version of that. It's called the plus one, and it's simple. I'm going to give you a string of numbers, and I just want you to add one digit to every number. So if it's a string of seven numbers, you're going to quickly memorize them, and then if it's a four, make it a five. If it's a six, make it a seven. Simple, right? So here we go. All right, now add one digit to each of those numbers. We'll wait for it. The truth is, most of you did this. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. I'm not going to do that. That's too hard. Here's what happens in the lab when they do this test. People have to like, focus really intensely. Their pupils dilate. 
their hands sweat, they have to push out all other focus or other attention and just really, really dig in deep and try and understand and, and focus on that. That is the slow system in action. That is your logic, your rational thought. It is slow, and that's good. Now let's test your fast system so you can understand the other side. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you an image or a word, and I want you to focus on your emotions and see how much information is, ex is communicated to you fairly quickly. You ready? Okay. After like a half a second, I saw a lot of people go like this. And it, maybe it was like a thought of like when I went with my family to one of the Disney parks, or maybe it was a movie that I had watched as a kid, whatever it was, like we have all of these memories you know, baked into this brand. And by quickly seeing that image, it all comes flooding back. Okay, so let's try one more. Let me give you one more image and uh, see if you can focus and see how much information is communicated to you. Sorry, that one's a little more somber for those you know, who are touched by this, but September 11 attacks. Here's the interesting thing about it. For those who were affected by it, I guarantee they can tell you even to this day where they were standing, who they were talking to, what time of day they found out, all of these details about that experience, and you don't, even, you don't even remember that it's there, but the second you see an image and someone asks you about it, it all comes back. All comes back in, in an instant, in an emotion. And that's the way our brains are worked. Like, emotion is what communicates all those past memories. It's what reaches back into our subconscious and lets us know about something that we've, a decision we've made. So let's talk about decisions. So now that we've got this whole logic and emotions and how it all works together and we know how they're playing together. Let, let's figure it out what's really going on when we make a choice. Let's start with a story. Imagine you're at work, you've been, had a long day at work, and it's time to go home. You go out and get in your car, maybe some of you take the train or the bus, either, either way. You go out and you get in a vehicle, let's, but we're going to do the, the driving example. You get in the car, you turn on the engine, you pull out into traffic, and then the next thing you know, you've suddenly arrived at home and you don't remember driving at all. You've just been lost in your thoughts, thinking about work or some other problem, and all of a sudden you're home. Has anyone ever driven on autopilot? A lot of us have done it, right? And then you, it's a little scary, because you're like, holy filth rot, I could have gotten into an accident, and that could have been really bad, and I don't remember a thing. Like, how did I even know to stop at a stoplight? What's going on? Now let's do that, uh, that same scenario, but let's say you're driving home, and all of a sudden you come upon a huge accident. There are fire trucks everywhere, there are police, and traffic is really slow, and as you drive past, you do your best job of rubbernecking to see anything you can see, because it, I don't know why we do that, but you have to just see a little teeny detail and then, and then go on, right? And it's as if everything slows way down in that moment as you're passing by, right? Why is that? Why do we have those two different experiences? The reason why is because our brains, uh-oh, I hit a wrong button here, there we go. Our brains are designed to detect anomalies. Think about it. Th these brains take a lot of energy, and they are constantly taking inputs from your senses. So from your sight, sound, hearing, touch. I mean, there is data flowing in at a constant rate. There's so much information pouring in. And there's no possible way that your brain can attend to all of it. It cannot. And we know that. Why? Because there have been different tests. For example, there are more dendrites flowing from the area of emotion to the area of logic than from logic back. Or, you know, even in your visual, there are more visual cortices that are flowing from memory to actual taking in of data. And what does that mean? That means that our brain is not designed to suck in a whole bunch of, of data and then store it. Instead, all of it comes in, but we only attend to a small amount. Like even in vision, if this is everything that I'm seeing and you think of in terms of pixels across the screen, right, that I'm looking at right now, our cone of vision is actually a small little area, and all the rest of it out here, the brain is just interpreting that and saying, this is what it should be. Because last time I passed by, there was someone sitting over here, so I'm just going to keep it there. We're not keeping all that information, and we're not sucking it all in. Our brain is, is because it's powered you know, by, by just a couple watts, we can't, we can't power it at full capacity all the time. So what we do is, just like when we're driving home, the subconscious takes over, and it will say, okay, I can predict all of this stuff. Only when there's something new or something different that I haven't seen before will I let you know 
conscious brain, right? And I got that for when I interviewed some neuroscientists. So this is how Dr. Stephenson put it at a university. He said, when our brain is doing its job at predicting our surroundings, our subconscious is in control. Only when there is an error or something doesn't match our predicted reality does the conscious brain kick in. Only then do we become aware and notice the element that's different. Okay, so this is really critical. So we're not like the NSA. We can't listen into everything, although I don't even think they do. But we can only attend to the things that we, we, we pay attention to, right? And that means an anomaly. This is going to be critical as we're moving forward in the rest of this talk. It has to be an anomaly. An anomaly is something that's different, something that's new, that's not our predicted reality, that's an error, that's something that's off, right? That's how the brain pays attention. Okay, so let's go through what's happening. Starting out, let's say you're coming to an, a situation, you need to make a choice. All right, th th let's say this thing is on fire and it's orange fire. Should I put my hand in there? Should I put my hand in fire? The first thing would happen is my brain would go back and it would check with the database of all the other experiences I've had, right? And then if it's, if it's a match, if it's like, yeah, we know that you should not do that, don't put your hand in fire, it'll just be a quick little flood of, of, of emotion. And how do we know that? Because we have spindle neurons. We have these really long-tailed neurons that wind around the brain, and a small fluctuation in a neurochemical like dopamine or oxytocin or serotonin can instantly alert the whole brain, like our fight-or-flight mechanism, right? And that little teeny bit, like neurochemicals, just so we're all aware of that aspect, neurochemicals are what regulate all of our emotions. That's what makes us happy, what makes us proud of other human beings, what makes us excited or sad. All of those emotions are really just neurochemicals, okay? So if there's a match, orange fire, it'll quickly alert me, don't put your hand in there, right? What happens if there's not a match? Let's say it's green fire. That's mystical. I've never put my hand in green fire. Maybe I should give it a try, right? So what happens then? If it's a new situation, an anomaly, something we've never experienced before, then we go to the CEO of the brain, which is that frontal cortex, right? And we say, all right, logic, we got a toughie here. Figure it out for me. And they'll just slowly crunch on it. That's why when you went past the ambulance, everything slowed down because logic was kicking in. And, you know, like it was taken over and saying, oh, what's going on? This is something new. And once it's figured that out and said, okay, you're an idiot if you put your hand in green fire or orange fire, and let's even just say yellow fire or blue, like it doesn't matter. Any fire, don't put your hand in it. It's not going to give you magical superpowers. Just don't do it, right? Once we've made that choice, how do we lock that in for the future so we don't have to do that again? Because that's how our brains learn, right? It's through trial and error. There's, a, there's an error, fix it. Okay, here's another one, go through it. The way it works is all these little neurons are connected. and they, Well, they're not really connected, but they're really, really close. And all those synapses, the way they communicate is by putting a short burst of that neurochemicals, right? And that's how from one to the next, that little burst is how it's communicated. It either turns on or off. It's just like if, you know, the, the things we need to make that memory, we need anomaly, something new, and we need neurochemicals, which are emotions. So if any of you have ever worked with uh, computers or, or data, you know that it's all like ones and zeros, right? In data, it's just a one or a zero, it's either on or off. That's the same way it is in the brain, except the way it works is that pattern, what we call a memory trace, that goes up and down, it's, it, it's just going to turn on and off different neurons as it moves along. And those patterns are what create a memory. And when we have 86 billion of those things in our head, and we're making new patterns all the time, that's why we can hold the whole internet, right? It's all a matter of which neurons, which emotions are, are, are hitting or firing. So it's not just in making memories, but it's also in retrieving memories. So let's say you had an experience before and you want to bring it back. That's why when we did that test of the FAST system and that little teeny bit like with Disney or the 9-11 or the picture, that little hit of emotion is because that was remembering this memory trace, that little string of emotion was flooding your brain and letting you know, okay, we already have that one locked in. We've got it. All right, so emotions are very powerful, very, very powerful. So here's a question for you. A lot of times in media, we'll ask the question of how many exposures does it take before someone understands your message, right? Someone gets it. We've done studies, right? It's like three with a repeating closer standard or six or seven. You know, how many times does someone have to see your ad to remember it? And I would say, let's, like, don't think about the number of times. We should be focused on how much emotion is in that message, the content. Because think back on the 9-11 example. And there are a lot of people with PTSD that have had one experience, one time, 
and they'll never forget it for the rest of their lives because it was highly emotionally charged. So it's more about how much emotion is present will determine if your audience receives and remembers the message. Very, very important. And here is just a little meta idea here. So if in reality, if emotions in our brain are just the way it's expressing, here's a past thought, or here's a past experience, or here's a past thing, it's really like emotions are a whole bunch of logic that, of decisions we've already made compacted into that little quick emotional hit because that's the way the brain communicates. And then it's only released when we need it. So in reality, if emotions represent a whole bunch of past logical thought, then logic is emotion. Emotion is logic. It's all the same thing. To your brain, it's the same. There's no distinction between logic and emotion. It's the same. It's just concentrated or, or one brand new little, little bit of information, right? That's pretty amazing. Like when you extrapolate that into our world, creativity and strategy are the same thing. If you think about it, if you're really trying to come up with a new strategy, you're making new connections, you're finding you know, new memories, whatever it may be, just like a creative person. Like it's the same act, just a different expression. So if that's all the same stuff, why are we fighting about it? Why are we battling over do creative ideas versus logic? It's all the same stuff. Anyhow, I'll stop on that one. When we make a decision, that's why like those neurons firing and in the pattern when you're laying down new tracks, all that stuff is happening. Like your brain is flooded with feeling when you make a choice. Here's another quote from a Dr. Stevenson. He said, when making a decision and locking in a memory, emotions are everything. In neuroscience, there's another expression. Neurons that fire together, wire together. In other words, the more activity you had in a certain pathway, the more it becomes plastic. And that plasticity is mediated by certain neurotransmitters and chemicals, also known as the regulators of emotion. So when we make a decision, our brains are flooded with feeling. So that's really, really important. That's how it all works. Like emotion is so integrated and such a big part of every choice and every experience and everything we create. So let's go back to that question. Should we place more value on logic or emotion? Who thinks logic? Raise your hands. Nobody? Come on. Okay, we got one. Thank you. A couple. What about emotion? Should we put more value on emotion? All right, sorry. This was a total trick question. It's both. It's not one or the other. We could, like, again, we've got to stop going back and forth and fighting about it. So it, it's not about strategy versus creativity. It's, it's just, it's both. And we, because let's think about it. Like, no one uses half their brain. It's not like you starve your logical half and your prefrontal and just start shrinking and then you just, you know, get this big creative right side. That's not what happens at all. We're using all of the brain all the time. But when we're making decisions, it's really important to understand the type of decision so you can make a better one. Let me give you some examples. So, if we're thinking in terms of your logic is your calculator, we still use calculators today, right? I mean, I do all the time. But then there's also, if, you're, if your subconscious is this huge, you know, the latest and best computer, there's a time and a place for both of them. And here's the, a good rule of thumb. Remember when we, those studies that said your logic can only hold like four variables? If it's a decision that only has a few variables, and they've done studies on like, vegetable peelers or whatever it may be. If there's just a few elements, like I like the color or the shape, you know, it's just very simple, then the best tool is logic. So if you're selling vegetable peelers, use a logical approach, right? It's just a couple variables. But what happens if you're selling something like a car or a home? And we may think, you know, has, has anyone ever walked into a home and it just felt right? Right? And you're just like, ah, this just feels right. And it's just that emotion, right? We think it's an emotional sell, but if you really look under hood, what's really going on? Your brain instantly sees and says, okay, lots of light, I love that. I need space here. I hate you know, kitchens that are all tight. I don't like it when it's dark and dreary. Like, there's a million decisions that are going on and going through your brain of like all your past experiences with a home. And it's just giving you that feeling of like, this matches, this fits, right? Because it communicates fast. Emotions are faster. So that's why when you're selling complex things, it's best to use emotion. So keep that in mind. A few variables, use logic. A lot of variables, use emotion, because that's how you're going to get to someone and understand and get to them quicker. So what am I trying to say with this whole thing if I'm saying, oh, it's both, so it's not, I'm not really answering anything. The truth is this. You know, it's always been, for years and years and years, creativity was like at the kids' table. And there's been a lot of effort, especially like at Adobe, we're putting a lot of effort into giving value to creativity and giving creativity a seat at the table. 
And with all the design-led movements of today, like there's a lot of companies that are understanding that value, and it's coming back, and there's this new resurgence of creativity today. And why? It's because science is caught up. We understand how it works. We know what's going on. It's not just, you know, hippy-dippy stuff where we're just trying to figure it out and, and giving your best advice. So what I'm saying is, give equal opportunity to both. It's creativity and strategy at the table. Art and science, brand and direct, right and left. It doesn't matter. Like, all of it should be important, and you should look at both of them. So here's the funny thing. <clears throat> I've seen a lot of articles over the years that say, aha, we have data-driven marketing. We don't need our guts anymore. Those stupid marketing guts are worthless. It's, they're dead, right? So let's stop and think about that. Like, that's not true in the least. What is, like, if, if your marketing gut is really all of your past decisions, all your past experiences, everything you've done in your career rolled up into that little emotional punch, is that something you should forget? No, that's like first-party data. That's awesome first-party data. Combine that with all the data that you're getting from your website or you're getting from some outside person, whatever it may be. Use that as a source of data. Don't ignore it and say, oh, if I want to be a true data-driven marketer, I'm just going to rely on, on, on the one set of data. And Because let's be fair, like, at Adobe, we understand analytics. Analytics, like that data is not the end of the story. The data is only going to give you access to anomalies, which will help you find insights, which will then lead to knowledge, and then you'll take that creative leap and come up with a creative idea, right? That's the journey. It all fits together. So give all of it a, a chance. And so my, my call to anyone who has a tough client or the CFOs of the world who just say, oh, all that fluffy emotional crap is stupid. Let's Let's get some serious business done, and let's, let's ignore that. I would say to them, you do not understand our biology. You don't understand how the brain thinks. You don't understand the importance of emotion in making decisions. You don't understand how it all comes together, and that if you want a better return on your marketing investment, then you should be really, really smart about when you use emotion and how you use it, because it's going to give you a better response. It's not, going to, it, you know, it's, it's not just going to be forgotten and ignored it will have a lot more integration and a lot more uh, stickiness. All right, so let, let me give you some examples of putting this in action. So we've gotten through all the nerd stuff. Thank you for sitting through with it with me. Um, now when we talk about in marketing, how do, we, how do we put this into practice? So let me start out with this. This is like the classic uh, pitch. So when I was in advertising for 20 years in, in agency life, I swear, we went to so many different new business pitches, and this was like the gist of every new business pitch. And it goes something like this. There are millions and millions of messages out there. And in order to stand out, the only way to do it is to get noticed. You have to stand out. And then if you're engaging, what we call sticky, you can, you know, if, you're, if you're connecting with them, then people are going to you know, pay attention. And if you ring true, if you're authentic, then you'll be believed. And if you keep you know, the message going long enough or get enough reach, finally you'll be remembered and you'll get brand preference, either, either through paying a lot of money or through a cool creative idea. And then if you keep up the story and don't screw it up, eventually you know, you'll get to brand loyalty. That's the story, and that's why we, we pitch these ideas all the time. I'm going to give you the same pitch, but I'm going to go through from a neuroscience lens and tell you what's really going on with all this stuff. So number one, getting noticed. What does that mean? There are three possible options that could happen. Number one, you could have a message that is so, you know, there's not even a great logical point to it, and there's no emotion. What's going to happen? It's going to go right underneath the radar. The brain isn't going to even notice. That, unfortunately, is like 70 to 80% of all advertising right now. Wallpaper. You don't want to do that. The next option is you could say, oh, let's just start with an awesome stat. Let's just put a cool stat in there and, you know, a piece of data, and then people will understand that it's important, and they'll, and they'll come flooding and buy our product. But what's really happening? If you're only going to give them a little bit of logic, they're only going to light up the front half of the brain. That's it. They're going to light up the cortex, and we're done. But what happens if you give them an awesome experience where it's like logic infused with all this emotion and you create this experience that pulls from some of their past memories? Then the whole brain is going to light up, right? That is the best case scenario. So if you want your best chance, light up the whole brain. Number two, stickiness. So I talked with this other neuroscientist, Dr. Carmen Simon, and she was talking about how when we get all these inputs, we really only keep like 10% of what comes in, a small portion of it. So the best strategy is to not just say, oh, we don't, have enough, you know, we don't have enough time to get into this creative storytelling stuff. Let's just get to this little fact. The truth is this, like, that emotion can be like that compounded effect of all these other logical thoughts. Instead of saying, well, we can only retain a little bit, it's important to say, what's the part we want to retain? 
what's the emotion? What emotion do we want our audience to feel? And that's really important. I've known some agencies that have gone, they've taken their creative brief and just knocked it down to one word and say, what's the emotion we want to hit? That's it. And it's really interesting. So when you want stickiness, it's important to just find the right emotion because the more that that emotion is repeated, there's more plasticity, more brain activity, all those neurons are trained, and then you get, you get more retention. Let's talk about the next one, liked. There's a book uh, written by Eric Duplessis called The Advertised Mind. And what he wanted to find out, he was a media guy. And he wanted to figure out what is the best you know, media, is, is it TV, is it radio, is it whatever, print, you know, all these different things, digital. How do we know what's the best, the best way that's going to be st- sticky and people are going to uh, appreciate it? So he did this study, and they took thousands and thousands of ads and tested them all. And at the very end of the day, on his whole book, the surprising result is the thing that mattered the most wasn't the media at all. It was this, if it was likable. If it was likable, far and above, people remembered it, people understood it, people listened to it, all of that good stuff. So what does that mean for us? If likability is the most important, then when you're picking an emotion, pick the right emotion. And I know, you know, as a young writer, creative, I was always mad when it was like the client said, oh, we don't want negative stuff, we only want positive stuff, you know, and I always fought that. But the truth is, if you're going to lock in an emotion and you lock in a positive one, that's why like, you know, fear and uncertainty and doubt doesn't really, it's not long lasting because it's not locking in good experiences, right? So it's okay to be smart. And there's a million emotions you could use, but just, just if it's positive, it's going to, your likability goes a long way. So keep that in mind. Likeability is important. Next, what about being remembered? So remember what we talked about. The greater chance that we have a lot of emotion present when a, when a memory is being created, the greater chance that you're going to lock it in. If it's just a little bit of, mem- of emotion, it's kind of a weak, a weak memory trace. And if there's a lot of emotion when it's, when it's pulled out, when you remember it, so let's say you use an ad that uses a lot of uh, nostalgia, that's a, you know, existing memories there, that's going to have a better chance of having a solid memory. So we talk about retention versus acquisition. It's always harder to get, to get acquisition instead of retention, right? Do the same strategy with brains. That's why, you know, if you come with a whole new different thought that is, is not relatable at all, it's really hard and, that, and people have to use all their logic to really figure it out. But if you have, like, let's say uh, Starbucks, they write your name on your, on your coffee cup, right? And they give it to you. The reason why that's super effective is because it's, your name is familiar. It's pulling back with things and feelings you already have about yourself and around you, and it'll instantly give you that little hit of dopamine and go, oh, okay, that's, that's nice. You know, I, I connect with that. So use nostalgia. Use experiences. Creativity is all about bringing new, two new variables together in a different way, right? So as long as you're using variables that people already have in their brains in a new way, then you'll have an awesome experience. All right, loyalty, same thing. If, here's, the, here's the problem. Memories can fade. If, if there's not enough emotion constantly, after a while it'll fade. So that's why branding and ads and everything are so important. Keep up good emotion all the time, and then you'll get loyal customers. All right, enough about that pitch. Let's go on to another one. This one's all about brand voice. So maybe this is a problem that only I have had in my career. Maybe you haven't. But I work at a big company, Adobe. There are a lot of products, a lot of teams, a lot of you know, people around the world. And when I started four years ago, I had this problem where it was like every different group was using the, the brand voice in a different way. And usually it was like whoever the senior director of the room was, they followed that, guy, that person's style, right? And so there was always this disparity and people were fighting and saying, oh, we're going after an IT audience. IT people are very serious. They don't like marketing and fluff. So the headline needs to be very direct. Like I would get that feedback. And I would say, I don't know if I buy that because we're all human and the fast system is emotion, not logic. So anyhow... What we did is we created this thing called the tone hierarchy. And it's really important because if you think about this as like an experience, where on the far left is the beginning of the experience, and as you get deeper and deeper in the experience, you go deeper into levels. And if we overlay our neuroscience, the emotional system is going to hit first, and then the logical system will hit second. So if it's, an, it's something like the headline of an email or the, or the top of your web page, like the, the tone should be engaging, human, and thought-provoking. It should be emotional. But as I get deeper into the experience and I hit a call to action, I shouldn't be getting fancy with the spices, right? It should be very direct and straightforward. And once we figured out this tone hierarchy, we went back to all of our stakeholders and, exp- and showed it to them, all of the fights stopped. Instead, we weren't saying, oh, the headline needs to be logical and straightforward. No, we're like, no, 
logic hits about halfway through, so the body copy will, you know, will hit that, but the headline is going to be this tone, and that's it. And once people understood how the brain works and how the systems come together, we weren't fighting all the time over headlines. Amazing, amazing tool. You can do it with art, you can do it with writing, whatever it may be. Just say, here's what's happening in the brain, and here are the different stages of the journey, and this is the right stage. Like, I've had some people take this and overlay it over their whole acquisition or retention campaigns and say, here's the right tone at the right stage, because that's when I'm going to use the right type of the brain function to use it. Super helpful. All right, so like, there's an example. Sorry, I'll go back. There's an example of an email. Like, the headline should be a level one, but the button, get the paper. I'm not going to mess around with the button. Same thing with web pages. Like, your home page should be a little more emotional because that's the first intake of someone new to your experience. But let's say it's a customer that's come back several times or they're hitting a product page. I don't have to have like, the most creative idea at the top of that page. In fact, that page, I can just have a nice human level three at the top and then get straight into some data and some facts because that's what they want. They're deeper in the, into the experience. And so again, it's like, it's, the, it's a time and a place. I'm not fighting about logic or emotion anymore. I'm just saying, whatever it is, here's where we usually have it. It's deeper in the funnel. All right, let's talk about attention span. I love this one. Even today, I'll get all of these articles that I'll find out there, and that'll say, the human attention span has shrunk to that of a goldfish, with only eight seconds. We're in trouble, people. We need to do something about this. So what's the knee-jerk reaction to attention span? It's Snackable content. Who, who has heard that? Everyone's like, oh, we've only, got, we've only got three seconds to capture attention. Therefore, it needs to be short. It, like only three words in your headline. And it's all got to be above the fold because people have attention span and they're just going to go to another website. And so we've got to get it all in the first little bit. And what does it make us do? It makes us focus on time. And we think the answer is time. Well, let's talk realistically about this. What happens in the brain? The brain is taking in millions and millions of things, and then what? It's going to push out most of it and only focus on things because of what? Something that has an anomaly and emotion, right? The brain, you don't need eight seconds. It can figure it out in a nanosecond if it's going to pay attention to it. It doesn't need to wait five seconds. It's not about time. For the brain, it's all about is an anomaly and is an emotionally charged. And if it is, I will pay attention and I will give you my thought. If it's not and it's wallpaper, I'm moving on. So the whole discussion should not be about time. If you get people who are telling you, oh, you need to just quickly cram it into a, a, you know, a three-second spot or you need to get it into you know, 10 seconds or, or you need to get this thing shorter because it's too long and we need a whole bunch of snackable content, you just need to pause and think, what is the, you know, what's the anomaly? What's the experience? What's the content? It, there's other studies on attention span that it's not even a real thing. Like, we give attention, but there's not this magical span that just stops working after eight seconds and it clicks, right? And we can't use it anymore. It's, it's false. In fact, I traced the story through some other articles back to the study done in, like, I don't know, whatever it was, like, 95, and it was all based on just a false story. So there's no such thing as attention span in marketing. We do have attention, and we pay attention to things that our brain wants to pay attention to. And it's all about quality of content. So it doesn't matter whether it's a long story or it's a short you know, social media post. In fact, there's this pyramid that um, Northwestern University, one of the best you know, integrated marketing communications programs, they have this pyramid focused on the different types of content. So if you're, if you're doing short, snackable content up there at the top, that's great. And there's a time and a place for that. But just know that's a shallow discussion. The purpose of that type of content is just to get a quick hit. It's top of mind, right? If you want a piece of content that's going to actually connect and make someone change their mind, then you need to start getting into some of this deeper content. And so I get this, this problem where someone will come back and say, we can't do any more articles that are over 1,200 words because no one's going to pay attention to that. And that is a false lie. It's all about the story. Is it an engaging story? They'll read the whole thing and more if they're engaged and it's, and it's personalized to them, if it's important. So again, don't focus on the speed, don't focus on time, focus on quality of content, and focus on, on the anomaly and the emotion. All right, usually in a lot of these presentations at the end, I'll, I'll always have these questions like, okay, Adam, I totally get it, emotions are great, logic is great, we need to balance it all together. How do I measure that? I'm a marketer, I need to measure this crap. How do I do it? And so here's what we do today, right? We do focus groups, Online surveys, we like to get in, bring in some experts. We're judging a show, we got to bring in the experts. Or crowdsourcing, which is the ultimate, right? It's going to let, let the populace tell us what's right, right? All of these tools that we use right now, the only issue is this. 
they're all focused on logic. They're all measuring logic. Even if it's a survey, you're giving me A, B you know, choices of a, of a thing and I'm trying to put on, I'm going to slow down because I, you're paying me money for something, especially a focus group. You're paying me money to, to give you an answer. So you're going to ask me these questions and I'm just going to rationally slow down and think and give you that answer. That's what almost all of this study is done on. Now, to be fair, there are a lot of people, a lot of companies that are trying to solve this in a better way. Uh, at Summit a couple years ago, we had Rana June and her company come out where they were trying to measure your emotions. Um, there's a lot of things, you know, Brain Juicer, Millward Brown. There's companies that are trying to come up with ways of how do we measure the emotional intake rather than just logic, but we're not there yet. It's exciting. We're getting there, but we're not there yet. So here's a quick rule of thumb that I can give you that, that will help. This is based on a story from Paul Zak. So he's known as the father of neuroeconomics, of putting money and neuroscience together. And he was on this airplane ride, and he was watching Million Dollar Baby, and he was bawling his eyes out, like he couldn't stop crying. And he was like, if anyone had asked me to give money to this cause, I, I would have just, you know, the money would have just flowed, right? And he was amazed. He was like, why did I have such an emotional reaction that I was like, I wanted to give all my money to this thing, right? So he went back, and they did all these studies of connecting paying money to emotion and, and to content, right? And here's what he figured out. This was his formula of how he could predict up to 80% accuracy or like 82% accuracy of if I show this ad to a person, will they pay you money, right? And what he did is it was all about two things, attention and emotion equals action. So he measured attention, which was easy. That was like, you know, sweat glands, dilated eyes, like how much focus they're giving you. Emotion was a tricky one. How did he measure emotion? And he finally had this insight, there's the vagus nerve that is the output of oxytocin. And it's like the main source of where oxytocin is. And oxytocin is what is the feeling that we have It regulates like our feeling of pride of our own team or we care about other people, right? It's that altruistic experience. And so he could take someone in the lab, hook them up, have them run some ads in front of them, and he could tell you if, if they were going to pay money for it, right? Here's the problem. Not all of us have access to Paul Zach's lab. <laughs> and it's really expensive. We can't just like focus group, test all of our ads in this lab, hook them up to EKG machines and, and say, will people like it? I don't know. So, but if you take the principles that apply here, here's how you can do it without spending crud loads of money in the lab. Number one, let's focus on insights, right? Anomalies. That's why we have data. That's why we have analytics. That's why this world blends so perfectly together. Get all of the data you can on, on someone. Understand your customers. And I'm not talking just like, all right, well, here's the clicks, or here's the whatever it is. Like, get behavioral data. Really understand what they care about. What are their triggers? If you understand your audience, then you should know what triggers matter to them, what they care about. Once you understand the triggers, go create an experience around those triggers, right? That's just taking that anomaly and putting some empathy or some emotion together, right? That's where you can be a great creative is understanding the anomaly and wrapping it in this emotional blanket. That's the power. And then once you do that, then measure it. This is easy. You go back and say, does B equal A? I know this sounds really stupid, but did, if, if, if we really know that emotional trigger, and that's in the brief, and then I go and create an experience, all you have to do is judge and say, is that creative hitting the trigger? And if it is, then you have a really good chance that it's going to be effective, right? It's just a real good gut check for you to know if, if something's right. You don't have to spend a ton of money on focus groups and, and tests until we get it all figured out, but that's just a real easy way to, to, to measure it. All right, so let's, uh, back to Russell's question, do creative ideas work better? Now, I know that this presentation isn't the end all. It's just the beginning, right? It's just helping you understand it. And the truth is I put all of this in a book that's coming out this fall, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, and there's, there's much more to it. But I think at the end of the day, we understand, if we understand how emotion works in the brain, we understand decision-making, we understand, you know, how we can retain it, how can we bring it back, like all those good things really, really help us understand that it's a, it, that balance is critical, that we need emotions. We can't ignore them. We can't just say, we're just going to go straight with logic and call it a day, right? We need emotional experiences and we need creative ideas in order to improve the bottom line. That's the answer. All right, well, before I get to the end here, we have a Q&A. Um, this is a great slide for introverts and extroverts. If you're an extrovert, you can email me Anytime you want, I'll send you a copy of the deck. We'll have a delightful conversation. It'll be amazing. If you're an introvert, I have a, a landing page here. You can go to adamwmorgan.com slash sydney, and you can download the deck, 
And then I've got a little sign-up sheet that if you'd love, I, have, I send out articles all the time, and I can send out information on my, when my book comes out this autumn. Did I say it right? This autumn in November. Um, anyhow, and just keep up with me. And I'd love to stay connected and chat about all this stuff because my whole goal is just to get ammo to creative people so that we can all have better experiences. So thank you.